<laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 139 of the Survivor's Guide to Life podcast. Uh, it's Friday afternoon for us and uh, we're following up on, we had a really, I enjoyed doing our last episode where we shared with you uh, an excerpt from a video from Patrick, our social media expert. And Patrick's message had to do with positivity and how positivity is the way to approach challenges in life. Today we're going to profile two women and their messages. Very, very strong uh, women. Very strong women <clears throat> with a very strong and valuable messages themselves. The first one is Harris Faulkner. She is a Fox News contributor. She's written a new book called Faith Still Moves Mountains. Mm, great book. And the second woman is a woman in the news, Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand, who uh, is not afraid to show the world that she's human. She's, she's the prime, she was prime minister. Yes. And you know, you read about her and how she handled things. Um, and talked about how she led her country during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Many, many challenges. Amazing how human she was yeah. and how it came out to impact people in such a positive way during a very difficult time. She had no reserve about being a human being first. And they talked about some, one of her first interviews on COVID, and she had just had a baby, yes. and, she was, <laughs> and she talked, or she was pregnant, she was, but she was very open. And she did it with a very casual, she was wearing a, a sweatshirt at home and very down to earth and talking to people from her heart as a human being. She truly is a human being, but she's a leader, not in the sense of what we consider we're leading in the sense of being swaggering and over authoritative and look at it. There's a humanity that creates a real leadership and a humanity here. This is a woman who's in the news lately a lot because she is giving up her prime ministership of New Zealand yes. in midterm because she's human and she's burned out. And uh, she felt her, her family was suffering, she was suffering, her health was suffering, um, and she felt that she had to set her priorities. And she was definitely a priority about self-care. And she said, too, that she felt that the job required to do it well, and she felt a responsibility that it be done well it required that she would bring something she couldn't do anymore. No, she talked so about the energy. it was time for energy. someone else to step in, yeah. yes. She said, not only do you have to have the energy for it, but you have to have reserves as well. Yeah. And she said she, she ran out. She doesn't have it anymore. But she's so open. Yes. And they talked about her uh, press conferences and how the press makes such a mess and tries to make something out of it. And they tried to make it a political oh, issue. Kind of spin it, right? Spin it and feminism. Yeah. And, yeah. and she wouldn't let them. And she said, no. She says, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm human, I'm tired, and I'm burned out. And this job calls for something that takes a lot of energy and a lot of leadership. And right now, I can't do that. And um, she was basically uh, asserting that she's burned out. She's tired. And in one of the... We have to find this... Um, a, a, the uh, editorial, but I saw it this morning, and it talked about all the levels of burnout that she discussed, mm -hmm. the emotional drain and whatever, and it's exactly what we've been talking about for caregivers and people who yeah. are involved in caring for others. Yeah. It was like right, this is a, the real application of the real, real life, yes. and it was right along the lines of what we've been trying to convey to everyone here yeah. about how important self-care is and how hard these jobs are and what they take out of us. And she basically ran it by them, and it was right to the letter, and I was so impressed. She's a, she is a leader, mm -hmm. and she's also an honest woman. And she just kept reasserting, no, I'm human. That's why i got to stop. We've also read a book lately that I have to definitely tell you about. It's called Faith Still Moves Mountains by a journalist that I followed for years, and her name's Harris Faulkner. I used to think she was like a model. She was gorgeous and so darn smart. And from New Jersey. I didn't know that. If I knew that, I would really pay How attention. could he not like her? Yeah, how could I? I didn't know that. But anyway, she's outstanding. And she's written some incredible books. But this last one is outstanding in the sense of she talks about, she's a Christian, she talks about her faith, but she talks about using this book as an example of how God works in the most incredibly difficult circumstances of people's lives. 
and this includes Christians who are in trouble themselves. And um, I love the story. Some of them have brought tears to my eyes, true stories, true episodes of people's lives where they were near death. It was so dangerous. And some of it was by poor choices and others just the tragedies of life come and how they had to deal with it. She does a beautiful job. And she talks about, as a journalist, how she's been in, exposed to so much of the ups in life and the downs, and she's been there for all of it. And she talks about how God's hand is in so much of it, makes itself most apparent in these very difficult times. Very interesting. She mentions a point that I love. And she said, and then there's those, there's those moments of silence that people are praying in there. They're not getting any answers, and they don't hear God responding, and they don't know what's going on. And they get angry at God. They get angry at themselves. They maybe feel unworthy. That's why he's not speaking to them. And she says, that's not what it is. We also have free will. And at those times, we have to take responsibility too. And she talks about those times God gives us a chance to find ourselves, our own strengths and our own capacities and capabilities. And it's not that he's not there, but that's a time that he gives us to discover the strengths that we have within ourselves and free will. I love the way she speaks about that. And that's, that is something that you have described in the past that sometimes, and you've, you've told me this, there are times when you don't know what you'll be capable of until you're in a situation that calls on you to be bigger than you are or draw more on yourself than you ever had before. Otherwise, you're not called to have to go beyond what you know. So true. And, I, you know, I tell you, the struggles in life, whether they're by poor choices or tragedies of life that happen, you can only do so much on your own. And I found, I've discovered this over and over again. Um, and I'm considered a strong person. I can tell you, I've come up to the end of myself many times. And I feel weak and broken and exhausted and depleted and, and incapable. And what's astounding to me is how God's presence makes itself known in my life in some way. And strengths come, come forth through me or through such that I know have nothing to do with my own strengths anymore, my own capabilities. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And there they show themselves. And that's God. It's in the Bible. He speaks about it in our most broken, weakest moments. That's when we, He is His strongest. I believe it. I know it. I live it. And reading this book, which is a really wonderful book, in how God puts together circumstances that we couldn't have programmed in our best day to bring us through or to bring people in our lives to, to help us or to work with us or whatever. And each story is tremendous, so powerful. Um, but you, you have a story like that. I think you've shared it before, but you had a moment like that with your accountant. In oh, oh. New, Jersey. Ooh, New Jersey, something you never expected would happen, and uh, that that it's, you were in a in an almost impossible situation, and God reached down, and worked through someone very unlikely <laughs> to be the person who would help get you through to the next. You know, I life. love this story, and uh, it's true. And not that I was a religious person; I, I was brought up in a religious home. I was not a religious person. But in my life struggles and in my battles with, in New Jersey, particularly in the construction business, I ran into some great difficulties with corruption and corrupted people, mafia people. And I was a young guy who had just come out of the service and uh, they jeopardized my family's businesses, they threatened us, and I went to war. I was young and I was ready to fight anybody anyway, and they came at us. But the truth of the matter is they are domestic terrorists. They're the worst. And I had to discover that over a three-year period as a young man, that I was not going to win this. One of the things I also discovered was that um, when you're in, a in a wars and in battles, and if you talk to warriors, they'll tell you the same thing. After a while, you lose your sense of what's right, and what happens is you've seen enough and you've experienced enough that you become more like your enemies. And that happened to me. So much had happened, so many terrible things that were unjust and violent. And frankly, I had reached a breaking point that uh, I, I wanted some vengeance and I wanted to start getting back and I had the capabilities and the people to do it.
But I knew that I also had a conscience, but I was losing it. And I'll never forget this. I was aware of it, and I knew I had to get, get, get away from the battle for a while, the battlefield. Um, and what I was came up against was myself. And uh, that was how I discovered horses. I rented a horse, <laughs> never rode one in my life, and took a ride. And I had to chill out because things were really just terrifying and terrible. And I remember talking, and I didn't know if it was to God or whatever, but saying, this is bad, and I'm losing my conscience, and I'm ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in new ways, just, just as bad as my enemies. That disturbed me terribly. And I remember it was the life I was raised in, so it was all I really, truly knew. And that's when I discovered again my relationship with God, because a voice came to me and said, this isn't a life for you. And I remember saying, I didn't know it was God, <laughs> saying, yeah, that's nice, but this is all I know, and I don't know how to get out of it. So I remember hearing these voices and offering me some encouragement and hope, and yet I had no clue how I was going to get out of it. And three weeks later, I'll never forget it, I got a call from an accountant that I had working for me, a wonderful man. I thought he was a nice, he was to me. And he was our CPA. His name was Phil Genovese, and I, to this day, laud the kind of quality man that he was. And he was our accountant, and he called me and he says, we needed to talk. And I went, I know, we've lost millions of dollars, everything's da-da-da. I, I said, I know. He says, no, it's not just about that. Anyway, I did finally go to his office. I didn't talk like I do today. And I remember talking, and I go, yeah, so what's the point? And I had a real New Jersey street life type of sound. And I remember saying, no, and so what's the point here, yada, yada. And he said, you know, I've watched you for three years, almost three years. And he says, I know that you don't want people to know this because you consider it, you're afraid they'll think it's a weakness, but you really care a great deal about your workers and your people and you take care of them privately. And then he said to me, uh, I don't think this is the life for you anymore. And I went, really? And I said, well, where am I, what am I supposed to do? And he looked at me and he says, you ought to get into, you need to get into something, a profession that has to do with helping people in trouble. And he said to me, do you know what a psychologist does? And I looked at him and I said, Phil, I don't even know how to spell it. What is a psychologist? And then he told me. And he said, it's a professional. And they work at helping people. And I remember saying to him, Phil, do you have to go to school? And I was already thrown out of school. He says, yeah. And then he looked at me and he said, you've taken on people that are very violent. And he says, you don't have a scratch on you. And you see the violence all around you. He says, do you know why? And I'll forget. I go, no. I'm a tough guy. He says, well, look at me, kid. You're, you're, you're okay because of me. And I remember looking at him and going, who are you? He's a nice CPA. And it turned out that his father was G Vito Genovese, the head of all the mafia families. I never knew that. And he said, my father has died. And all these families are battling for power. And you've, caught, you've stepped on a lot of toes. And I can't help you anymore. I didn't even know he was helping me the whole time. And he says, it's enough already. He says, you've got to start finding, you got to make a new life. A life that has to do with helping people. And he says, and it's time for you to leave New Jersey and find a new life. And he says, where were you in the Army? In California. He says, that would be a very good place for you to go, very quickly. And I did. And I did. And he actually helped me financially get going and on my feet as long as I went back to college, which I did. But anyway... I want to ask you. Yes. Do you think God answered your prayer? I do. Through Phil. I do. I think he used Phil. I really do. And it was interesting because I was sitting in an Alzheimer's support group two years ago in Santa Rosa mm -hmm. while I was taking care of my wife who was dying of dementia. And um, there was a man in the group who was very upset. And he was crying and his, he was taking care of his wife who was dying. And... Um, it turned out that Phil had saved him when he got out of the Vietnam, Vietnam as a pilot. And he was very upset, I remember. And I said to him, I, who are you talking about? And he's told it was Phil Genovese uh -huh. that pulled him out of it and, and acknowledged him. Anyway, um, that was a, it's a small world. That was 50 years later. And it, it moved me to hear God's hand works through many people we don't even know are going to, it brings don't us together. Don't expect at all. It and, can happen like and that. And in Harris's book, she talks about story after story of how God worked through people to save 
others and help them. So through some dire circumstances, people who had been suicidally depressed, others, uh, terrible situations. And it's a great book of hope. Mm -hmm. And here's this other lady, and I hear she's not mentioning God, and I'm thinking, how many politicians is her, in her powerful position have come to do what she's done and find the courage and faith and trust to do it? And the humility. And the humility. Now, she doesn't talk about her relationship with God, but I'm listening to this going, how often do you hear this kind of thing? And I believe that, that God's in, God has his hand in this too. Mm -hmm. I have a great, great deal of um, faith in that and trust. I personally live by that myself, and I've dealt with a tremendous amount of struggles in the last few years, especially since my wife was so sick and passed away. And I help a lot of people who really struggle with hopelessness and discouragement and despair. We talked Do, about that last time, too, yes. about Patrick's message. So we're, we're still on that theme today. You remember that? I do. Patrick's a young man, and he knows more than many of the people who are 50 years older than he is that we help. Yeah. And what he talked about is how easy it is during the struggles to focus on our problems and the darkness and the emotion of it. And he says, and to lose our perspective on life and to see hope. And he spoke about it beautifully in his episode. We're going to have him part of our show. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick's an exceptional young man who's been through some tremendous struggles and tragedies. Um, he's one of the survivors of the Rwanda genocides. But what, what's come out of it, to me, is a young man who's understanding the message of how God works through these difficulties and how he moved Patrick, in this case, through some devastating pain he was losing his vision and went through serious surgeries and was very pained mm -hmm. and beside himself. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how he got to step beyond it mm -hmm. and reach out and begin to help others and get involved with others. And I remember the story, I know this is true because I know Patrick's always been like that. And he's talked about the power of positivity. And he was really talking about God's strength during those difficult times, how he discovered it and rediscovered it. So anyway, um, I want to reiterate that message to all of you, and I want to tell you, this is one of those women that's an outstanding person and woman, and a true leader, and she stands heads above many, many people, men and women alike, and can be such an inspiration. All they have to do is open their hearts and minds and step beyond their negative self-images and anger and troubled relationships and see that there is hope anyway. And if anybody is an inspiration, other than my wife was, yeah. it's Jenny. Yeah, I and I will add one other thing that Patrick said in his video that, that really I agree with. And he said this was when he was at home in great pain after his surgery and having a hard time getting going again. And he said what came to mind was choose life. And that really spoke to me because it is a choice what we do, the actions we take, the attitude we hold, all of our choices are choices. Yes. And if we don't see them that way, if we think we are powerless or helpless, we are lost. Or filled with self-pity. Or filled with self-pity. Which is easy to do when you're feeling a lot of emotional pain. Sure, that happens to us all. And a lot of us who feel like they deserve better and, and good things should come to them. And it doesn't always happen that way at all. No. Patrick speaks to that. Mm -hmm. And frankly, you got to step beyond that. It's such a destructive attitude. It is. It is. It's toxic. And um, we hope we're conveying this to people who we know are on the front lines. And we are human, and we know you are. And there are times when we slip into some self-pity or real pain. We're not talking about being perfect. Pain. We're talking about getting hold of ourselves and choosing to change course. No more self-pity here, though. Don't worry about it. No, I, I stepped beyond that. <laughs> this long doesn't ago. happen over No, here. not that part. Pain, plenty of. Pain, but. No, self-pity. That get doesn't into. happen too much. You know why? Because I'm afraid of the impact of it. I wouldn't dare get near it, and I help too many people who wouldn't indulge it, and I see the destruction of it. So, no, I don't like that. No. But I'll tell you what. We're human. And, I, you know, I discovered that, too, through my struggles, that I'm not just Dr. Peter Bernstein. I'm Peter Bernstein, a human being first. And I really correct people when they want to go to that. And my experience as a professional, and I go, don't do that. I'm just like you. I'm Peter Bernstein. And I hope you relate to that and let your barriers down. It seems like people do. 
and know that you're human. There's nothing to be ashamed of it. In fact, you should be grateful. And whatever comes your way, you will find God's hand is in that and working to help you even through the difficulties. For those of you who are caught up in self-pity and hopelessness, go beyond it. Use some discipline and reach out. Don't sink deeper and deeper, please. And we know that if you're a caregiver of any kind, how easy it is after a while when you're burning out and you're exhausted. That's the time for self-care. So hang on to those words. And uh, as always, we will be back uh, in the next podcast with more that I hope will be just as helpful and as inspiring yeah, as this. And Patrick will be back too. Okay. That's right. All my best to any of you, all of you. The Survivor's Guide to Life podcast is brought to you by Sonoma Coast Trauma Treatment, a 501c3 charity that relies on donations to keep us on the air and on our YouTube channel or in all the regular places. We have Facebook, Instagram. Please like and share. And uh, Peter and I can be reached at 707-781-3335 or Jenny at BernsteinInstitute.com. I hope I've remembered everything. Uh, oh, SCT, sctraumatreatment.org. That I forgot. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you again next time. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.